Welcome to Eight Limbs. Today we're speaking with the fabulous Denise O'Moore from Ireland, and she is a positive reward based dog trainer and the founder of the Facebook group Dog Sense. Denise, welcome to Eight Limbs. How are you today? Hi, are you, Jason? Um, I'm great. I'm delighted to be here. Um, awesome. So um, let's uh, start by having you tell everybody how you got your start in dog training, and did you also start as a positive dog trainer? Uh, I did start as a positive dog trainer. Uh, like most people in dog training, I always wanted to work with animals. Um, I actually started uh, just over 10 years ago as a puppy walker for the guide dogs as a volunteer. And uh, I just loved what I was doing but wanted to do more. So then I started to study, um, continued volunteering start doing a couple of courses, uh, workshops, seminars, anything I could get my hands on, I was into. Then I switched over to the Irish Dogs for the Disabled, which is a fantastic uh, charity down in Cork that specialises in training and providing assistance dogs for children and young adults with physical disabilities. So at that point, I had gotten my foundation degree in behaviour and had set up my own uh, dog training company, Puppy Power. So that's really where I got my start. Um, positive reward-based training was always the thing we went with. Uh, I think because I got my start with guide dogs, and that's the way we, we train all our assistance dogs over here, so there was never kind of any option to use any other type of training, any force training, um, which I never really understood because they're animals. Why would you do that? I agree. And then, yeah, it's like it, just, it just made no sense to me. And then last year I certified as a fear-free um, professional trainer with the Dr. Becker. So I was absolutely delighted I got that one. Uh, it, it put a whole new spin on how I could introduce positive and kind of really positive vet trips to owners. Well, that's really great. I mean, it, the fact that you started by positive methods and you didn't have to do any crossover or that you weren't confused is really great because, as you know, a lot of people do start out by using prong collars or choke chains and things of that nature, and then they find out, wow, there's really a, a dark side to this approach. So kudos uh, to you for having not only that beginning, but also just having the, the insight to, like as you said, not treat animals with you know the use of fear and pain. Uh, is there a divide in Ireland between pain trainers and positive trainers? Because here in America, um, you know, it's a really big divide. There's people who will use shock collars and prong collars and blame the dog and can label them dominant. And then there's people on the other side who will never do any of those things. And then there's some people who are kind of in the middle. Um, so what is it like in Ireland? Um, it, it, there is three sides. There's the black, white, and the gray. There is force, there's positive, and then there's that balance in the middle. Um, I, I think it's, it's like that everywhere. But the one thing I have noticed in recent years, I hate to say it, is kids. Kids with their family dogs. Um, there seems to be a big rise in people getting pets for the children because the children want the dogs, but the parents are kind of right. It's your dog, you go walk it. Um, I, I actually had a run-in a few months back with a 12-year-old boy who had a four-month-old uh, beetle on a prong collar because his dad said that's how dogs are trained. I was like, no matter what I say to him, that child, he is a child. He's going to go home and that's what he's living with. That's the way he's been brought up. So a lot of the more forceful trainers that would be over here or forceful owners that I've encountered, they kind of steer clear. They do their own thing. Positive trainers do their own thing. Uh, but there, there is certainly a, an element of that over here. And it's not so much with the breeds you would expect. It's actually with breeds you'd never expect to see. Like um, recent encounters would be like golden retrievers on shock collars, uh, eagle on a prong, springers on e-collars as well, 
choke chains on boxers, you know, bleeds that you just don't expect people to feel the need to put in those. Um, generally, it would be larger breeds or bully breeds or the restricted breeds and people just wanting these breeds to show off how powerful they are or whatever. But you, I'm just not seeing that anymore. I'm seeing a lot of really well-behaved larger dogs. People are putting more effort into the large dogs. Hmm. Well, that might, might also just be you know, people who have a dog that is considered dangerous by some, which we know that, you know, no dog is inherently dangerous. But, you know, if you do have a, a, a dog that might be, you know, a little bit um, apprehensive for people to deal with, then those people might feel, uh, you know, that it is better to train positively to not cause any issues. Um, it's sort of like little dogs a lot of times don't get the respect big dogs do. And so a lot of little dogs end up with, you know, fear of hands and reaches um, you know, going back to what you're saying about, you know, children, I think it, it works the other way too. Um, you know, I've done a, a lot of, uh, seminars for kids in schools and I always send them home with tons and tons of handouts because they're going to go explain to their parents, Hey, look what we learned today in school about dog training. And, you know, my hope is that they'll read it and they'll change their mind or at least, you know, give a second thought to getting that electronic fencing system and things like that. So, um, yeah, it, you know, I, I just think that in the end, people either are stuck in sort of a cultural fog, like the gentleman that you were speaking of, you know, this is how we train dogs, or they want that quick fix and they've been sold a bill of goods, you know, by somebody who told them, if you just do these things, your dog will be, you know, better. Um, but as we know, behaviors in the environment and humans are the variable. So are, are there groups in Ireland that are working to educate people about the dangers of using fear and pain-based training? There are. There are numerous companies over here now. Um, there's three main ones in Dublin. That, well, Dublin and Wicklow, um, Annie Ed, Positive Dog Training, and um, Wonder Paws out in Bray. Uh, they, they all, they're so positive-based. They also train trainers. You know, they're really getting the word out. Another thing that's been happening a lot over here is that the pet stores, the large pet stores, are starting to get in new staff that are actually educated or have a, a, an education in training, all positive, which is fantastic because they're actually able to communicate them with clients coming in looking for equipment to train their dog with and they're kind of pointing them in the right direction. There's also the PPG. Um, it's worth its weight in gold between the resources and their webinars. Everything they provide is fantastic. And as they have all these new chapters in the different countries, like there's BPGBI, which covers England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales, it, it makes resources more accessible for trainers and owners that we can get the word out there that this is this is how you do it. This These are the results. You know, just keep at it. It works. Mm. Yeah, and even if, you know, you don't get, you know, the results you want, the, the, the mantra that I'm always uh, giving to my clients or people in general is that behavior is in the environment, not in the dog. Humans are the variable. And that means, you know, you have to train based on your environment. It's just that simple. Um, I always give a sports analogy. You know, the team might play one way against this team. They might change up their play a little bit with that team because that team's different. So it's about staying flexible, as we know, and being open to the environment, the dog. And honestly, I really, you know, want people to understand they have to focus on human behavior more so than dogs. I mean, obviously... We want to focus on the dog behavior because that's what we're looking to change. But um, the variable being the human, uh, I find a lot of times when people stop focusing on the dog too much and they remember the things they're supposed to do, then the dog behavior changes. So, um, and PPG Pet Professionals Guild uh, is you know my favorite organization. I'm a proud member and I blog for them. And I just did an interview with Nikki, Nikki Tudge, who's the founder and. Uh, Man, what a what a great group, and I'm really glad that they're around. So you have a Facebook group called Dog Sense. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and why you decided to start it. Uh, basically, I was getting tired of the large groups on Facebook. I, I think Facebook and social media in general is a fantastic tool for getting education and information out there if used correctly. But I, I was getting to the point where 
a lot of the groups are too big. There's a lot of misinformation. Dr. Google seems to come into play every other thread. Um, and there's a lot of crossed wires. People are getting misquoted. You know, I, I just wanted something small. Not so much like a chat room, but more like a little coffee shop where everybody could just come in, sit down, have a chat, not feel judged, ask whatever. You know, open up information to people. Um, okay, that doesn't always happen. I mean, there's always going to be, when I was on Facebook, it's just the nature of it. But we found, uh, when I say we, I mean, Martha Young and myself, uh, when we started Dog Sense, we started originally for professionals and trainers, but now we've recently opened it up to, and students, but we've opened it up to owners as well. And we find, like, when there is confusion out there and somebody posts a thread, we tend to say, okay, people aren't understanding this, so um, let's get somebody on who's an expert in that field, have them on as a guest. They have the, the whole group for an hour to answer questions. Uh, recently, we had uh, Dr. Borda on because there was a bite, a fatal bite attack in the UK that was really badly represented in the, the whole interview in the newspaper that was published was very bad. It really put a bad focus on certain groups that weren't even involved in the attack. So it was good, in, rather than have people speculate and say, well, should have done, could have done, we just got an expert in to answer the questions. Uh, recently, even with Grisha Stewart's BAT, there was a question about that, and people were starting to kind of comment. We thought, well, you know what, Grisha's in the group. Let's get Grisha in, and thankfully she is coming in at the end of the month. Uh, so she's going to answer all, everybody's questions. So really what the group is about is we want people who have questions to get the answers they want from the people who know what they're talking about. Sounds good. And you're absolutely right about social media. I, I think that for all the good that it can do, uh, it does open itself up to wise guys and know-it-alls. And I love the phrase Dr. Google. I am give, telling you now I'm stealing that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, um, just to briefly touch upon the media and dogs, it is a wasteland of misinformation. I had I was just watching a podcast by... Uh, couple of comedians uh, who I will not name and they started talking about dogs and the information that they had which of course they said so assuredly now mind you if uh, me as a dog trainer was on a podcast talking about comedy as assured as they were I would be laughed off the podcast but it's just amazing to listen to people talk about dogs who have no knowledge of animal behavior or behavior in general or applied behavior analysis or any of the things that those of us who do this legitimately work really hard to not only learn but to apply so I applaud you for having a nice safe group on Facebook I know I've I've weighed in here and there I'm, I must be on over 200 groups people just add me and I'm so busy throughout the day doing email support and you know being a dog trainer behavior consultant that I I, I really stay off a lot of the groups but I, I do peek in from time to time I love what you guys do um, thank you for sharing uh, the perspective from Ireland on positive training. It's really interesting, I know, for myself and I'm sure other people who will listen to this just to get an idea of what goes on. And it seems like there's a lot of parallels in Ireland as there are in the United States where people are divided and there's a lot of misinfo. So thank you so much there for... And, well, actually, there is, one, there is one point I would like to get across. Oh, of course. Um with uh, Breed Prejudice and BSL, in like we're very close to the UK. They have very strict BSL laws where they do have breeds banned. We're in Southern Ireland, so we actually only have restrictions on breeds. Um, there's no breed that is banned over here, but they are restricted. We have about 11 or 12 breeds that are restricted which actually just means you can have them, but they need to be muzzled in public, they need to stay on leash in public, they can't be walked by anybody under 16 years of age type of thing. Uh, the only time they're not... The, the only exceptions would be um, the police dogs, the harbour police, state airport police, rescue teams, and guide dogs. 
for these certain breeds. And the breeds listed include all the bull terriers, Mastiffs, Doberman, Rottweilers, German Shepherds, the, the usual suspects. Um, whereas I remember a while back there was the case in the north of Ireland with Lennox, the, the pit bull who was put to sleep. And a lot of people seem to think that Ireland has that rule. We don't. <laughs> We're Southern Ireland. We don't have that rule. Hmm. Well, that's good to know. I mean, restrictions are, uh, you know, n- not good in the sense that all dogs can wind up in bad situations. I am in favor of people having their children walk dogs when they are 16. I would say that when you learn to drive, you start to formulate risk assessment. Um, there's been a lot of studies that the human brain doesn't even form risk assessment very yeah, well until, exactly. you, until you're about 16 or 17. So, you know, I mean, again, keep your dog on leash, make sure you have adequate fencing. There's a lot of good restrictions for dogs in general. Um, I obviously don't agree with any restrictions for certain breeds um, because behaviors in the environment and humans are the variable. And we've seen it, you know, time and again where other dogs may, you know, have bitten lethally or fatally, but yet they don't get the headlines that, you know, another dog of another breed may get. Uh, we just saw in Montreal, Canada, where uh, a boxer was involved in a bite incident, and you know now all of these these bully breeds are 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 banned. And I spoke with a pit bull advocate from Montreal, and she was detailing, you know, the criteria, and it's very sketchy. It's not. There's no exact. It's very weird how they're determining what dogs are banned and what dogs aren't. So. Um, well, that's, you that's know. the thing. I mean, all dogs can bite. They're all capable of biting. Mm-hmm. You know, if you annoy a dog, they can't turn around and punch you like a human does. They they use their teeth. I mean, and it depends on your, kind of your age, whatever, your size, mm-hmm. the size of the dog, the damage they can do. I mean, a young puppy could kill a baby by one bite, by accident. You know, so th- th- these breed restrictions are... To me, personally, I think they're ridiculous and they just lead to more more problems. Mm-hmm. They lead to more issues. Um, well, it drives a lot of people who are already prone to nefarious activities to seek those dogs out, you know, so if you already, yeah. if you already have sort of a criminal mind and you're up to no good and you think, ah, oh, geez, well, I'll just get a couple of Rottweilers to watch my drug operation because... Yeah, you and know. now you have a list of 12 dogs to choose right. from. It's like, right. ooh, which dog will mm-hmm. I take now? And and that same neighborhood, you could have a family of four upstanding folks, a couple of children, and they have a couple of Rottweilers. So now that family, who has a completely different lifestyle than the criminals down the road, have the same dogs, and people who are looking at these dogs may make a preconceived notion about people because they have these dogs. It happens all the time in, in, you know, in America. I have clients who have friends or family who would say, oh, why would you ever get a pit bull? They're this, they're that. So, you know, sadly, I think that us educators will never be without a day where education is not needed. And that's a, well, a lifelong the control thing. Of dog, the control of dogs regulations uh, came in around the late 80s, early 90s over here, just as we had gotten her first family pet. Um, so because of the law, naturally she had to be muzzled. But the prejudices back then, like that that was a wake-up call to me because this is her first pet dog. And to me, she was just a dog. She wasn't a breed. She was a pet. What kind of dog was it? She was a Staffordshire bull terrier. Ah, my favourites. And people, and she was black, kind of a brindle colour. She had actually... Um, we had gotten her from a newspaper ad. Now, we're going back almost 30 years here. We'd gotten her from a newspaper ad. She'd been abandoned. She was found roaming the streets, and she followed this young guy home. He had three English bull terriers, and she took shine to him, followed him home. And he couldn't keep her because he was in a small apartment. So he couldn't find the owners. He put her up for for adoption. Um, he was He was actually, he was amazing with the questions he was asking because I remember my dad slamming down the phone and I said to him, so are we getting the dog? He says, no. And I said, why? He says, well, the young man said he should be great for fighting. And um, what did I think? And I, he said, I'm just not into that. That's disgusting. I'm going to report him. 
Now, it turned out this was something that the young guy was actually asking everybody to get their reactions. So just to make sure that the dog wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. Because it, as it turned out, after we got her, we brought her back and we got her checked. And she had an awful lot of scarring on her underside. And the vet seemed to think she was so young, but she could have been part of a fighting ring or abused. So thankfully that young man did recognise the signs, was totally against it and managed to vet everybody. We managed to get her. She was stunning. She was real, such a pet. But walking her down the road, people were crossing to the other side of the road and staring and pointing because these laws were just coming in. And then when we had to put the muzzle on her, people were just running across the road in front of traffic to get away. And then we'd have other people following us, asking, where do you live, how much for the dog? And it was like, oh, dear Lord. You know, it's going to be like this with every dog. So now, as I say, they've brought out a list of 12 you can choose from. Yeah, I mean, I I think I remember seeing that story uh, in Ireland, and there was a certain politician, and I remember seeing some pictures of, of different, you know, um, like uh, announcements and, and placards being put up and sort of, you know, signs with these yeah, breeds. Yeah, that, that uh, was very recently, yeah. but that is actually an old regulation that dates back to 1998. It's the Control of Dogs regulation from 1998 with the list of 11 dogs. He just needed to do something. He refreshed it and put photos of the dogs. Oh, no. And it just hit the media. Mm. It just spiraled out of control. And uh, God love my ex, he felt sorry for him because I think he thought he was doing his job, but in fact... There's quite a blowback there. Oh, yes. Well, people love dogs. And, uh, you know, my my take on it is this. If you can actually have a, a sober conversation with someone and you have the facts, the science, you have all the anecdotes, you, ha- you have everything in a row, you can illustrate to somebody how ridiculous it is to ban or you know have restrictions on certain types of dogs um Mm. you know ultimately humans are the variable and we all all of us professionals have stories of dogs who came from horrible you know beginnings to become fabulous dogs and we have stories of dogs who were bred uh, by reputable breeders and people paid thousands of dollars and the dog ended up with not only health issues but behavior issues Uh, like i always tell people you know if you go to the shelter or you go to a breeder, it's the same crapshoot. It really is because there's a lot of breeders who don't take their care of their dogs as well as dogs in a shelter. And you know, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of shelters who are absolutely terrible, but there's a lot of shelters who are very good. So it really boils down, I think, to whether or not people want to do the work with the dog that they get. Mm-hmm. And, and and if they do, and they have you know good resources, and they have proper trainers and people to help them, then that work becomes a lot more manageable. Uh, and, I, um, you know, I think that if you, again, if you're in the right camp, if you can get the right information, it makes things so much easier. And I think that's that's the battle and the challenge is making sure people get the proper... Well, I mean, I, I always info. think back. I always think back to when we got Pixie, our little staffy. I mean, as I say, we're going back about 30 years. I was only a kid. I, I didn't know there was such a thing as a dog trainer. You know, it was, you know... <laughs> Just everybody had dogs. I've heard that from people. Granted, all yeah. dogs were kind of roaming the streets or working in farms. You know, there was there was very little information out there. But she came from a bad background. She came from an unknown background. We didn't know what she was trying to hand signals as we discovered the hard way when she lunged at at my mom for pointing her finger at the cat. Uh, so we thought, okay. Well, we won't do that again. Huh. It wasn't a case of, oh, my God, the dog tried to bite me. It was, all right, well, now we know enough to do that again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was common sense. Uh, Which she was is hard to come by. To, yeah, she was kind of, she's our pet. You know, leave her be, she's now part of the family. And if we could muddle through that and have the like, what I consider one of the best dogs ever. Mm. Well, I give you, you know, a lot of credit. It sounds like your family was, you know, again, you know, a loving family that loved dogs, and that's what it takes. Well, it takes, kinda, you know. Well, we kind of grew up in common sense. If the dog is eating, leave it alone. If the dog is sleeping, don't wake it. Mm-hmm. If the dog growls at you, 
back off because, you know, it's trying to tell you something. You're in its way. You know, it wasn't so much let the dog get away with murder. It was kind of a case of give the dog space and a bit of respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really, I mean, that whole idea has really been uh, taken down by, you know, certain training ideologies and TV personalities about giving the dog respect. And that's really sad. I mean, I have tons of respect for dogs and... Um, you know, I, I didn't know anything about dogs when I got into them. I, I always tell people I knew nothing and, uh, I was an open slate. So, you know, fortunately I just was able to get the right information, you know, uh, more so than not and take the right path. Um, Denise, Mm -hmm. I want to thank you very much today for speaking with me. Um, I hope, hopefully we'll be able to talk again at some point. Um, now that you're part of the eight limbs family, I would love to have you back on. If there's ever anything that you ever wanted to address, just let me know. Um, but thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it getting the perspective. Not at all. Thank you so much for having me on. Really You're welcome. appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> You've been listening to Eight Limbs. My name is Drayton Michaels. We've been speaking with Denise O'Moore from Dog Sense in Ireland. Everybody have a great day, and we'll talk to you later. Take care.